Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to discuss why Concord matters for vestments and pyramids. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessor in conversation about this matter today is Pastor Anthony Elephant. He is pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. Pastor Elephant, welcome back to Concord Matters. Pleasure being here, just like it was last time. Yeah, absolutely. It is a great pleasure to have you back on Concord Matters again. And today to talk about some various liturgical fabrics, vestments, and pyramids. And just as we get started here, I, I just want to acknowledge right from the start here that perhaps at this point, if you've been following along this series of Concord Matters that I've been doing here the last several weeks, about nine weeks or so now, Perhaps it's at this point that some people may just begin to think, okay, Pastor Sean's lost it. He's taken this show off into the weeds in this series. And that's probably because most would say it's more important to talk about the great doctrines of our faith from the Lutheran confessions. You know, that chief doctrine of justification, the person of Christ and the Lord's Supper and all of these important things. And talking about vestments and pyramids, maybe not as important to dedicate a whole show to those sorts of things. And I would certainly agree to some extent to say that the great doctrines of our faith are what this show is about. And certainly, have no fear, we will be getting back to talking specifically about the doctrines. Yet at the same time, I do think that every single one of my guests that I've had in this series so far have all pointed in some way to the reality that we all know, which is that what we see does say things about what we believe, often before we even open our mouths. And so what we see does confess. In fact, again, pretty much every single one of my guests in this series has made the point that there is great intentionality behind the things that we see in our worship and in our Christian life that is formed by the doctrines that we have. And I think this is where we see these things show up a good bit then in the Book of Concord as well. And we'll certainly be bringing that out today that, yes, we do talk about vestments and pyramids in the Book of Concord. And we saw some of that just a little bit as Chaplain Sean Denzer in that four-part kind of mini-series within this series, talking about the confessional principles of our worship. We touched on a few of these things, and I think it's worth just delving in a little deeper on these. And so I want to continue this theme a little bit longer here in this series and talking about why Concord matters for the various things that we can see. And today we'll be doing that by talking about vestments and pyramids. So Pastor Oliphant, I want to go ahead and start out with you then. So with that little setup there, what is confessional about vestments and pyramids? Well, I, I think you brought up a really good point that when we think about the teachings of the confessions, we tend to think about these doctrines, right? These statements of things that are true. And that is good. However, just as our Lord didn't remain an abstract way, truth, in life, but he became embodied and was among his people in a very physical and real way that could be apprehended by the senses. And, you know, he still gives us sacraments that are apprehended by our senses, that it's fitting for us to take those doctrines and to translate them into things that we can see with our eyes, touch with our hands, and so that we can actually learn them by being embodied creatures and making use of the various materials that God has given us in creation toward their proper end of 
confessing the truth. And so, yeah, why would we talk about things like vestments and pyramids? Well, because that's talking about Christ and what he has done for us. And so we have these wonderful examples of all these times that the Lord has taken people's skill and that he's instructed them to take materials in order to create these visual ways of teaching. Um, We can see it in stained glass windows. We can see it in fine artwork so that we can deepen our understanding of these things that our Lord is teaching us. Yeah, I like how you took us back to scripture even before the confessions. I think that's a very, you know, faithful to the Lutheran confessions approach. I mean, we certainly see that in our book of Concord as they go back to scripture. And this is what our Lord has given us. And it's been brought out several times. Just again, when we think of the building of the tabernacle and then temple in the Old Testament, certainly great detail is given to the sorts of things, even down to the vestments that the priests are supposed to wear. And we see our Lord use real physical, tangible things, especially in the sacraments that he gives us. And so I'm into everything you just said there. So as we jump into this, then talking about vestments and pyramids, where do you want to start us in terms of some principles or laying the groundwork of how we want to think confessionally about these things as they pertain to our Lutheran worship together? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the tabernacle because that was the first place that my mind went. You know, when we talk about vestments, you know, what the guy up in the front is wearing for the services, we actually have the clearest example of what Aaron, the high priest, and his descendants are supposed to be wearing when the Lord sets up the worship with the building of the tabernacle and he gives really, really clear instructions on this is what Aaron is going to wear for these various services that he performs in this in the tabernacle this is what he'll wear on this day of the year and so we see him taking just this exquisite kind of detail in exodus where aaron is wearing you know a breastplate with 12 stones on it one for each tribe of israel he's wearing a turban that has a signet attached to it that says holy to the lord he has the ephod he's wearing a coat and a sash that he has these very very explicitly spelled out vestments that he's supposed to be wearing and then furthermore his sons the ones who are going to be serving in the tabernacle as well uh, and the ones who are going to be the upcoming high priests His sons are also instructed exactly what they are supposed to wear when they're in the tabernacle doing the Lord's work. And so we can look at what it is that the Lord has them wear, and we can learn a little bit about what the purpose of these things are. You know, we have Aaron, he's wearing a breastplate, which wearing that, you know, going to church and putting on armor, unless you're preaching a really controversial sermon that week, that's not one of the things that we really think about the pastor having to wear. So we have Aaron putting on a breastplate, he's putting on a sash, these things where he's kind of like tightening up, right? And then we also have him wearing this turban, as I mentioned earlier, with a signet that says, holy to the Lord. And so we can learn from this that there are two different things, that there's something potentially dangerous about what Aaron is going to do entering into the Lord's presence, and that he needs to be protected or shielded from it. And the Lord is actually giving him a way to be protected from this holiness that destroys all unholiness in the Lord's unmediated presence, which we read does fill the tabernacle and later on the temple. So we have this idea that Aaron is entering into holiness and he's had his unholiness covered, shielded, as it were, so that he's able to safely perform the duties that the Lord has given him to perform on behalf of Israel. But we also have these other marks of his office. And I'd mentioned this breastplate that has the 12 stones, all of them representing Israel. And we have these things that are also, they're not just protection for him, but they're also marks of his office. It tells him what his place is in this created order. So it informs Aaron what he's supposed to be about, what he's supposed to be doing, and even in fact tells him who he is that he's the one who's serving on behalf of those 12 tribes of Israel that he's wearing on his chest. And that then in turn, he's going to speak to the 12 tribes of Israel the words that the Lord has given him to speak. And all the while, he's going to be protected, shielded, or veiled in this holiness that the Lord has instructed for him to have. And then his sons also are going to have marks of who they are with the uniforms, the vestments that they wear, so that anybody who sees them knows, okay, that's the high priest, these are his sons, those are the Levites, that's what their job is, so that they're able to kind of figure out what their place is in this 
very complex and wonderful created order that God has made. And we also see that with the uh, pyramids, too. Within the tabernacle, the Lord does instruct that they're supposed to be like these blue-violet veil that separates the most holy place from the holy place. So this veil that, again, works as a protection so that we don't have Israelites wandering into God's unmediated presence that could potentially destroy them, as we do see examples of that happening in Scripture. But then also, the Lord tells them they're supposed to be decorated with this fine embroidery, that they're supposed to have the most skilled craftsmen in all Israel. And they're supposed to be doing things like putting signs of the heavens, you know, the stars, again, to show them their place in this created universe, that this is where heaven meets earth, that they live in this wonderfully ordered and structured creation, and that this has been all done for their benefit. And so we can see from the vestments and the pyramids in the Old Testament that they serve two different functions, to enter into the holy presence and then as a mark of the office. Of course, things are a little bit different now that we're on this side of Christ's incarnation and birth. But yeah. Yeah. Well, so on that then, and I have to admit here, I never made this connection ever before. Maybe I fell asleep in seminary. If this is a connection, I don't know. I'm interested in your thoughts. But as you mentioned, the breastplate that Aaron puts on, of course, I've read that. I've seen that a hundred times. My mind immediately went also to Ephesians 6. And what St. Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God and the breastplate of righteousness. Right. And I don't know, it's an interesting maybe connection there that I've just never even thought of until this particular moment in my life. But then also what I really want you to get to is then getting us into the New Testament as we live, you know, on this side of Christ having come, accomplished his work and awaiting his return. You know, in the New Testament, we don't see necessarily those specific details, but yet we still, at least in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, have these things as a part of our worship. So what's the New Testament view of these things? Right. Yeah, that's actually a really great bridge when Paul tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, he's talking about putting on something that is external to ourselves. You know, we don't want to approach in these situations relying on anything that's coming from us that we're going to have to put on some kind of external righteousness. And it's much the same way that Aaron put on the righteousness of those vestments that the Lord had consecrated. And so we can see that we're putting on this righteousness of Christ. And this is exactly what Paul is telling us to do. And this is what kind of brings us to what vestments are doing now. Because Christ has come and fulfilled all righteousness for us, we are covered in his holiness, our sins are forgiven, We now have this, we still enter into the presence of God, but we enter into the presence of God not through the shadows and the figures that things like Aaron's vestments were, but we're entering now through the substance of this righteousness, which is Christ. And so when we have vestments today, we know that part of the vestments function in the tabernacle has been fulfilled. That is that we are shielded by Christ when we're in God's perfect righteousness. And so we, we don't have those vestments functioning that way in our chancels today. But they still do have that, that other function, that the vestments today, they still do function in a way that help teach us about this created order that we're in, teaches us our place, our duties, and it shows us an office. You know, it's not the office of priest or high priest or Levite, but it's the vestments that we have now, they are marks of the office of preaching. And they serve as these marks in a couple different ways. First is they function like any uniform does. You see somebody walking around in a policeman's uniform and you know that they're a policeman. So you can go and talk to them if something is going wrong. You see someone in a soldier's uniform, you know that they're a soldier. You see someone in a pastor's vestments and you know that guy is the pastor. And so it's just kind of that's the point blank visual cue that they provide. But the vestments also function in a different way that the vestments are They're not accidentally the way that they are, as kind of these robes. When they're worn as these robes, they give a visual cue that we're hiding the man and we're lifting up the office. We're lifting up the office of preaching. And the reason why is not because pastors are by nature higher than anyone or anything like that. It's not that they are given any extra honor or power or authority or anything because of that, but we lift up the office because it's Christ's office, because this is the office that Christ chooses to speak to us through. 
And we can talk about this from the angle of the Augsburg Confession in Article 5, talking about the way that God has chosen to give faith is through the ministry. In order to obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. And so the vestments there kind of serve as a big arrow to point to and say, this is where preaching is going to happen. This is the guy who's going to be administering the sacraments according to his Lord's institution. And so the vestments today, while they may not shield us from holiness, they still do cover us up in a way that helps hide the man, all of his uh, foibles or particular personality peculiarities. And it instead just puts Christ on the outside so that when people look, they can see Christ's office, they can see Christ preaching, Christ forgiving, Christ administering the sacraments. And uh, this is kind of important, I think, because when we have this visual cue here, it serves as a barrier to keep us from falling into a cult of personality where, well, I like this pastor because you know, of whatever reason, because he always has nice shiny shoes or because I can tell he's good at what he does because, I mean, he doesn't have a cheap belt, right? So we can keep from falling into these cult of personality. And this also goes for preaching and other personality stuff, too. But when we have these visual coverings of the man and all his shortcomings or strengths, then we're not focused on him. We're not focused on his clothes. We're not focused on his appearance. It focuses us on what it is that he's doing. And, you know, it also works the other way, too. It also helps keep the pastor in check from not thinking that it's all up to him and his abilities and anything that's coming from him. You know, we can actually see this. I think a great example is in Luther's vestry prayer. When the pastor is putting on his vestments for the service, there's a different prayer involved with each piece, whether it's the long white alb that's underneath it all, asking to be covered in Christ's righteousness, or the cincture that goes around his waist, asking to be secured in chastity and purity, or when he puts on the stole, he remembers when Christ says, take my yoke upon you. So he puts it over his shoulders as he's picking up the duties of Christ, preaching the word, forgiving sins. And then even for the other vestments as well, at Redeemer, I wear a chasuble for services when we have communion. And for that one, the prayer is asking to have the garment of immortality restored to us that Adam and Eve lost in the garden. And that's an important one to remember as we're preparing for the church service, because you know, the Lord's Supper is where we are have our sins forgiven and we're strengthened in the one true faith in body and soul. Again, there's that created body aspect strengthen in body and soul, in the one true faith to life everlasting. And so putting on that chasuble, praying that the Lord would restore to us the garment of immortality, we're asking God to do what you promised to do through me today and not let me rely on my own strength. And so the vestments serve as kind of a check for the observer and also a check for the pastor so that they can remember that this isn't about the guy in the front. This is about the one who sent him. I think that's a really important point. My mind goes to 1 Corinthians 3, when St. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, you know, some of you are saying, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, and he says, aren't these just men? What is Paul? What is Apollos? They are but servants through whom you have believed in Christ. It's all focused on Christ, and I do think that I found myself in my teaching in my dual parish here a lot encouraging my people to see worship and even Bible study and those sorts of things and the funeral service or a wedding service or anything that we do in the church as kind of God says, I have something to say about this. And we're going to speak through this guy to you. And if we can cover up that cult of personality, because like you said, it can really be about anything. I mean, sometimes it just gets down to a lot of folks of, you know, whether they think one is friendly or not. Hopefully your pastor is trying to be friendly and we just all have different personality gifts and struggles and as any person does as well. But if we can put all of that aside and as you said, just focus on Christ, cover that up, cover up all that personality, especially as pastors tend to have a lot of unique personalities. I don't know, sometimes <laughs> it's just the way it works in the church, but we cover all of that up. But I think that this kind of like in our confessions, you always have a positive theses. And I think you've been laying that out really well for us from scripture, especially. 
of where we see this, and I love bringing in Augsburg 5 there as well, is our understanding of the ministry and how that influences all of this. But our confessions also talk about the negative side, things we reject and condemn. And on the opposite side here then, just because I think it ties in with what you said, you brought in the robe and you talked about how that hides the man. And I think when it comes to vestments, and we'll get to pyramids here as well too, I think in a minute, but at least when it comes to vestments, I think most people are probably okay with the robe if they're okay with vestments at all. And we can also talk about other denominations that don't do vestments at all. And we'll get into maybe some of the reasons that they don't and why we do. But just sticking with the robe, for instance, that it hides the man, they'll be okay with that. But then you also brought in the chausable and some of the other vestments One that can be used on festive days is a cope. And, you know, sometimes we might call some of these things the higher church vestments, the higher church liturgy vestments. And a lot of people probably think of them as very Roman Catholic. And it can really be off-putting for a lot of people, especially these higher church vestments. And sometimes we'll even hear things like, oh, you're just trying to show off or things like that. So in talking about that and understanding that, what is important to consider about the confession of our faith with any vestments that we choose to use in our services? Why would it be good to encourage these things that people not be put off by them, but that we would include them? Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, a lot of that comes down to just what people have experienced personally in the church of growing up, what they've seen. And then, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of assumptions that this belongs to that particular church body or we don't do it that way in this denomination. So a lot of it comes down to that. But I think one of the things that we always want to go back to is what is it that these things are saying? What is it that they're meant to say? And what is it through their actual practice and being used are they saying? And so, you know, I think that it's an important thing to bring up in the Augsburg Confession in Article 15. It deals with a lot of these ceremonies, or we could call them traditions, ceremonials, things like whatever. But Augsburg 15, it does say that if something can be observed without sin, it ought to be observed. This is a mark of the Lutheran Reformation in that it didn't try to just overthrow everything and start from scratch. That was the approach that some took. And Luther and the other reformers, they came down pretty hard on that. That was not the best way to go about instituting change in the church that you had to teach. And so I think that would be the answer there to keep it from being off-putting, to approach these things with humility, approach them with the humility that the vestments themselves are supposed to be communicating, that this person is covered up in Christ. And so to put on that meekness of Christ and to show what it is exactly these things are saying, it's not about showing off. It's not about extolling the man that's up in the front. In fact, it's about hiding him as much as we can. And so the Augsburg 15 is really clear that when it comes to these ceremonies, that if they can be kept without sin, without offense or scandal or the undermining of faith, then they should be observed. And this is for the sake of, it says, for tranquility and good order. And, you know, we've seen these things actually cause anything but that. Different ceremonies or differences between the East and the West. We see a big split in 1054 AD between the Eastern and the Western Church. And a lot of it has to do with the ceremonies that they're using. That's unfortunately one of the things that can happen when traditions are different and they're not being treated with charity and meekness. And so we can see that continuing in the controversies regarding Adiaphora, that the formula of Concord approaches when it comes to Article 10 and different Adiaphora in the church. Those things, Adiaphora being those things that are neither commanded nor forbidden by Scripture, but they're left to our good reason. You know, I think that's one of the great things about Adiaphora and the confessions is the confessions never just say, oh, that's Adiaphora. It's not commanded. It's not forbidden. So do whatever you want. The confessions don't approach that approach it that way at all. They that instead of that being the end of the conversation, it's the beginning of the conversation where they say, Did Christ say we have to do this? No. Did he say we can't do it? No. Okay. Well then let's talk about pros, cons, what it's good for, what it's not good for. So that's actually the beginning of the conversation. And vestments and pyramids certainly are part of that. And so then it comes down to having a conversation about it, finding out what it is that's off-putting or potentially off-putting, what it is that's beneficial, and then seeking to highlight the ways in which this enriches and benefits Christ's people. 
All right. I think that's a good place to go ahead and take a break. I want to pick up this theme of Adiaphora on the other side, as you've given us there, you know, it's the beginning of the conversation, and then we can start to talk about the pros and the cons. What does this benefit us? What does it bring to the church or point us to? And I want to lay some of those things out that we can think about when we evaluate the use of vestments and pyramids within the life of the church on the other side of this break. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFU. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org careers. Welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking with Pastor Anthony Oliphant. And we are talking today about why Concord Matters for vestments and pyramids, the various liturgical fabrics or chancel adornments that we use in our worship services. And we've been seeing that we confess the faith with these things. These things are scriptural. They are in our Lutheran confessions. We're going to continue to unfold that. And just before the break, Pastor Oliphant, you were talking about Adiaphora, and I really like the way that you phrased that. And we had an earlier episode just talking about matters of Adiaphora. And so obviously there's a lot of crossover in these things as there is in all of doctrine, really. I mean, there's various ways to come in and talk about the body of doctrine. It's all together. And so there's going to be a lot of crossover on these things. But especially as it relates to vestments and paraments, I like the way that you frame that there, that Adiaphora begins the conversation. And then we can begin to talk about what are the pros and cons? What are the benefits of using this? What are maybe some of the drawbacks or things that we don't want to confess and don't want to say with using things, especially, again, relating to vestments and pyramids in our worship services? So go ahead and take us into then how do we consider matters of adiaphora as it pertains to these vestments and pyramids and their use within our worship services? Yeah. One of the things that when we're talking about Adiaphora, because it's neither commanded or forbidden, this was something that you had touched on here, was we don't want to make people think that because it's not commanded or it's not forbidden, that it's just something that's completely worthless. We also don't want to make people think that because they do it differently, that they're somehow sinning or because they're doing it wrongly or even that they're not using it at all, that they're somehow sinning because, you know, there is no commandment against these things. And so, therefore, we can't say that these things are a a soul-threatening sin or something that separates people from God. And so, one of the important things to keep in mind, especially that Augsburg Confession does in Article 15, is it says that these things are good and the things that can be observed without sin ought to be observed. But then it goes on to say that we can't bind consciences to think that these things are somehow necessary for salvation. That because your pastor doesn't wear a chasuble, it doesn't mean that you're getting less communion from him or that his absolution isn't as good. Likewise, if your pastor does wear it, doesn't mean that his absolution is any better or worse. But again, those things are meant to draw us to Christ, to point us to what he's doing. And so human traditions that are instituted with the sole purpose of atoning sins with God you know, winning or meriting grace, that these are opposed to the gospel is what the Augsburg Confession says. And so one of the things we don't want to do with paraments or with any kind of adornment up in the chancel, whether it's the pastor's vestments or what we're putting on the altar, we don't want to make it seem like this is something that is winning forgiveness or salvation. In fact, the Augsburg Confession says if we're trying to turn those human traditions into something that wins those things for us, that they're useless because they're actually teaching against the thing that they were supposed to be showing us is Christ. And instead, they're pointing us back to our own works. And so what we want to do is make sure that we are teaching the benefits of these things, that we're very clearly showing what it is they're supposed to be pointing us to, and that is Christ. 
but we don't want to make it seem as if that salvation hinges on them somehow, that if we don't do them or we do them wrongly or anything like that, that somehow we are breaking a commandment. Something that I was just thinking of as you were talking there too, and I like how you have us pointed towards Christ. And when we're considering this, we're thinking about this is where our focus should be directed. And As it pertains to decorations in the church, if you will, whether it be on the pastor himself, that would be in terms of the vestments and in terms of the pyramids on the altar and pulpit and lectern and those sorts of things. Sometimes you get pushback of, well, we don't need it all fancy in here and things like that. Again, for some reason in our culture, people are just really put off by these things at times. But I was finding myself reflecting on We could talk about, well, why do you decorate your homes for various seasons and pointing to those sorts of things? Or why at weddings or proms or other events in life do you dress in specific ways? And as you evaluate those things for your family and what you want to say about that time, that season or that event, then we would do the same thing in the church too, right? We would think about these things and we would want to consider these things. And at least for me, this is kind of where I learned to come down early on as a younger child and so forth, is that when you see vestments and pyramids, like you said in the first half of the show, it's like seeing a uniform. I know those are holy things. I don't see those anywhere else in life except for in the church. And so that itself also points me to this holiness that we're entering into God's holy presence in these things. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts and reflection on back on that? Again, it's like you said, it's not making us better than, or we're not trying to show off or any of those sorts of things, but we're just considering what is it we want to confess and say about what we're doing here, gathering together here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the example of decorating our homes for the different seasons, because why is it that we do that? Well, it's because we live in time and space. We're creatures that were bounded by these things. And when we have things that change with seasons or change with a certain time or things that mark us as having different offices or different vocations, then that's good. God has created us to have these changes, right? I mean, one of the things that I do like about being a pastor is that my job has a rhythm to it. You know, if I had chosen a job where every single day was exactly the same, I know myself well enough to know that I would get pretty bored with it. But the fact that the church has this pulse and this rhythm and this breath to it, that it changes. You know, there's some seasons where it's a little bit quieter and I can go in the sanctuary and work pretty uninterrupted. And then there are other seasons where the church is full. We have people coming and going all the time. We're focusing on different charities that we're supporting. We're having multiple services during the week. And so these things that we have, whether they're vestments or they're pyramids, they also kind of serve as a little roadmap for where we are in creation, both in time and in space. And one of the one of the great things that I love to do, we, we have our Sunday school opening in the sanctuary at Redeemer, and we do that very intentionally. It's not just because it's the most convenient place to gather kids as they come in the building, but we have them sit down in the first couple rows, and then I always ask them to take a look and They're always able to spot if something has changed, whether my vestments have changed or if the pyramids have changed or if there's something different about the front of the church. And and they're almost always able to spot it. And then I give them a little quiz and I say, well, what was it last week? And then what is it this week? And then that gives us a chance to talk about where we are in the church here. And so then we can focus on the different themes of the church here. So we really put our altar guild through the ringer in October. You know, we've been in the long green season, Trinity or season after Pentecost. We've been in this long green season. And then we hit St. Luke's Day. So it was white pyramids up in the front. And then we went to Reformation Sunday, red pyramids, then All Saints, white pyramids. And then the next Sunday was back to green. And so we've been, we really put them through the ringer changing out the pyramids. But the kids all noticed. Every week it was a different color. And it gave us the opportunity to talk about why we had these different days and what the different themes are behind each special day in the church year or each season. And so it actually served as a great springboard for talking about the doctrines 
that we embrace in the church. And then it just gives us this great fuel for talking about it. And then I we can rewind and we can review when I asked them what the color was last week. But yeah, it just, it serves as this wonderful teaching instrument, showing not just where we are in church, in space, but where we are in time as well. Well, and I actually end Sunday school because in the dual parish, I have to come over <laughs> to the other congregation. And so I end Sunday school and I gather with them in the church as well. And I'm sure you do this as well. I do this I always point them to that even the colors are saying something about the season right. and we change the colors. Why do you want to just talk a little bit of, again, why do we have the different colors and put our altar guilds and so forth through the ringer on changing those back and forth and things? Yeah. Well, I mean, colors, it's just, it's this great thing that our Lord has kind of engineered our minds and then within our own cultures too, they take on other additional nuances, but, Color is something that it's very, very deep in the human mind. And so, you know, we hear red and it's always, you know, blood red, fire is red. And so whenever these red seasons, it's always attached to a martyrdom, somebody who shed their blood for the faith or the coming of the Holy Spirit with fire. We have white, you know, it's the hardest color to keep clean. So it's spotless, right? It's pure. So purity. So we can take a look at the purity that's involved in it. We have white. Green is when we have things that are alive, you know, life being breathed into the church through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, meditating on the teachings of Jesus during the long green season. And so we have all of these colors that have these deep attachments in our psyche that we're able to use that as then a teaching tool where we can explain why we're doing things the way that we're doing them and what we're focusing on during these different seasons. And again, the fact that we adorn the altar and also cover up the pastor with these colors, it again points to, it's not about just what the pastor wants to talk about that day. It's what is it that the Lord has to say to his church during this season? You know, it's as much as I'd like to, I can't just talk about whatever I want to. I'm bound, I'm under authority. And part of my marching borders are well, as we're entering the season of the end of the church year, as we're entering the season of Advent, part of my marching orders are to remind the Lord's people about that. And so it helps remind us what it is that our Lord has taught us. And, you know, it's always appropriate to speak our Lord's word, but there are certain seasons where certain words have an additional weight and the pyramids and the vestments help us with that. Yeah. And I think just highlighting what you have brought out so well for us is that all of this serves to teach, which again, returns us to the Lutheran confessions, especially in how they talk about ceremonies, is that ceremonies are useful for this purpose, and that is to teach. And so as it pertains to that, then go ahead and give us some other foundations from the confessions of things that we consider, some of those principles that we consider as it relates to vestments and pyramids and what we want them to teach and confess about our faith. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've been talking a lot about the 15th article of the Augsburg Confession. And, you know, as I'm sure it's been discussed, the Augsburg Confession was then presented to the Holy Roman Emperor, and then Rome had a chance to respond. And when it responded to this particular article, there's a little bit of a surprise from Melanchthon. Rome accepted that first part, that ceremonies that can be observed without sin, that they ought to be observed. Rome was all in on that. They loved it. What Rome rejected was the second part, which we talked about where it said, you know, you can't bind consciences in these things as if they were necessary for salvation. And Rome rejected that when it replied to the Augsburg Confession in a document called the Confutation. And this was a little bit of a surprise for the Lutherans in Melanchthon. I mean, it sounds pretty innocuous, right? That you can't tell people that they're sinning if there's no word from Scripture saying that this is a sin. And so the reformers were quite surprised. And so Melanchthon, he, when he writes back, he writes his defense against the confutation, and that becomes the apology. And he has to really hammer it home that we do not merit the forgiveness of sins or grace by celebrating human traditions, by observing them or not observing them. And uh, here he says, you know, if you hold that by obeying the law, and here he's talking specifically about the ceremony of circumcision that Paul's addressing in Galatians. If you say that by obeying these things, you merit righteousness before God, then Christ benefits you nothing. That you're saying, you know what, I think if we do this right, we'll be good with God. 
and that covers all of our bases. And again, what that does is it pulls away from the very thing that they were supposed to be pointing toward, and that's Christ. And then it, he argues the point that when that happens, it takes honor away from Christ, and it also robs people of the comfort that they have in Christ by forcing it back on them obeying some kind of custom or tradition or ceremony if it forces it back on them that they must obey it absolutely correctly and perfectly otherwise they're sinning well that takes away the very comfort that they were supposed to be receiving from christ it also dishonors christ by telling him that his sacrifice wasn't enough that there's something else in addition to what he achieved that must be done by us and so we see this theme coming out in Melanchthon's writing, especially, and he, it shows up here too when he's talking about different church ceremonies, that there are these two things that the confessions are always trying to do. They're trying to show the highest honor for Christ, and they're trying to comfort terrified consciences. If it doesn't do those two things, then it needs to be removed, is what the Augsburg Confession, and is what the confessions argue. So these are the two principles that the confessions are operating with. Does it show honor to Christ? And does it comfort consciences? Does it point them to the complete and full salvation won by their Lord? And so, yeah, this is the MO, honoring God and consoling consciences. Now, the irony is when we're misusing customs and traditions, they're actually twisting them. It's pretending to be a really high honor for God, but it's trying to earn his favor by saying that we're doing something that he needs to look at and be impressed with. Or if we're telling people that they're not doing it right because they're doing X, Y, or Z, and that their salvation is now at stake, now we've robbed their consciences of the comfort that should have been theirs. And in fact, the very comfort that we're trying to communicate by using these things. So then, as you've given us that twofold, to honor Christ and to comfort consciences, I suppose the pushback might be, well, how do vestments and pyramids do that? Right. And I like that you gave us the irony because certainly if it ever becomes about, you know, well, you're not really doing church. And I don't think that most people that make use of vestments, again, especially some of the higher church vestments, I don't think that's ever actually the intent yeah. behind those things. But I think that sometimes that's what people think. And so that is an irony. If it ever becomes about that, then it's like, yeah, let's be done with the vestments because it's pulling us away from the wrong thing. But at least, again, as it relates to vestments and pyramids, how do those help serve us to honor Christ and to comfort consciences? Right. Yeah. So then once we've set up this confessional principle of those twofold thing, then we actually need to hold them up to the test and see, are they doing those things? And I would argue that from what we've said so far, that by using vestments in an effort to take the human man's personality that's up there, by taking that as out of the equation as much as we possibly can, by covering them up in Christ, and by reminding the congregation that it's what Christ is doing through him in his office, I would argue that that is showing honor to Christ because it's saying Pastor Oliphant is not the one who's going to save us, right? And so what it does is it says Christ is the one who's going to save us. Is he going to use this instrument? Sure. But at the end of the day, that's what I am, an instrument. And then we also, when these things are used appropriately, you know, we could use the example of pyramids here, pointing us to different seasons in the church here. What it does is it walks us through what our Lord did here on earth and what he continues to do, seated at the right hand of the Father, on our behalf in order to save us from our sins, leading us out of temptation and delivering us from evil. And so, again, that's for the comfort of the conscience. And it's extolling the work that Christ has done and is still doing. And so I would argue that using those two principles, we can see that vestments and pyramids really are a wonderful tool, according to the test that the confession set up for it, that they are, in fact, putting Christ over and above anything that we're doing and pointing continually to him and what he's done. And in doing that, it's reminding people of the forgiveness of sins in the eternal life that he's given them. And I think we want to be very clear about this. We're not saying that these things themselves do the honor to Christ or comfort conscience. They point us to those things. It's Christ doing it all the time. Right. And I found myself, as you were talking there, all of a sudden, and this may seem like an obscure connection, but I think it actually is a real connection, that when we talk about the Lord's Supper, 
when we talk about that our Lord uses bread and wine and it's connected to his word of promise that it becomes his body and blood, that it's not the bread and wine themselves. It's Christ and his word that delivers it. And I think Luther picks up on this in the small catechism, right? When he talks about how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things, he says, certainly not just eating and drinking do these things, but the words written here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. It is what Christ has done. And he's using this instrument of bread and wine, which I think is exactly what you were just pointing us to there, right? You know, yeah. these instruments serve to direct us to these holy things that Christ is using for our benefit. Yeah. Again, it's these created things that God is then using to bring his word to us. And so I'm I'm glad that you brought that up with the catechism because he says it's certainly not just eating and drinking, but it's the word that's written there. And then he also says, and it's the faith that receives it. And ultimately, these things are good because they're teaching and they're strengthening faith. They're reminding people of what it is that they're going to church for. You know, so it's not just rote. It's not just something that they do because it's what they do on Sundays and they're too old to sleep in anymore. But it's reminding them why they're there. And so it's strengthening that faith that holds on to the promises that are communicated. Absolutely. Well said. With a few minutes left here, I want to get your concluding thoughts, parting thoughts. Obviously, I think so much more that we could talk about. Some people might think it's crazy to spend a whole show just in talking about vestments and pyramids. But again, I think you've highlighted really well for us that these things are scriptural. They are confessional. We want to consider anything that we do in the life of the church from scripture and the confessions. That's how we operate as Lutherans. And I think you've done that really well for us today. But go ahead and give us your concluding thoughts then about why Concord matters, why our agreement and Christian confession matters for vestments and pyramids in the life of the church. Yeah, I think our agreement and our confession on this matters because we have to acknowledge that these things are not going to be the same across the board in every single place. And the confessions acknowledge that and they say that's perfectly fine. What is it that we have our true unity in? It's in the gospel. And so then, whether your pastor is wearing just a stole, whether he's wearing a chasuble, whether you have pyramids up in the front just on the altar, or if you have big banners that you put up that also shout the church season as well, that it's okay for these things, for these customs to be different in different places, because really it comes down to what is it that these things are teaching? What is it that they're proclaiming and confessing? And that is the same gospel. And then what we do is we recognize that. We do have that unity in the gospel, whether it looks the same in every single place, whether it sounds the same in every single place, that's okay. Because really it's about what Christ is doing for his church. And then it's about finding the best ways that we can to teach that in the places where he's set us. And we rejoice when there is that agreement. Exactly. I mean, I think one of the things thrown at us, and I think you've just answered that question that I probably should have asked earlier, too, is when it's thrown at us, hey, that looks Roman Catholic. Well, hey, let's rejoice in that because we have unity in this, right? At least that's my short take. I don't know. Just a few more words from you on that. Yeah, I think that we can rejoice that even in spite of, we know that we do recognize that in other church bodies there is false teaching, but we can also recognize that in these little hidden ways, by the created order that God has made being ordered toward the proclamation of the gospel, that in these little ways, the gospel is still sometimes preserved for some of the Lord's people. And so that we can give thanks that in spite of man's best efforts, that the truth about what Christ has accomplished can still be preached. That is well said. Thank you to Pastor Anthony Oliphant. It has been a great pleasure having you join us for Concord Matters today and discussing with us why Concord Matters for the liturgical adornments of vestments and pyramids in our worship and in the life of the church. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church. (laughs) 